on behalf of festival co-directors Namita Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to GLF's Brave New World. We hope that you've been enjoying our many sessions featuring philosophers, philanthropists, scientists, medical doctors, economists, chefs, activists, diplomats, spiritual leaders, and so many more. And should you wish to view any of the sessions, you can watch these on our Facebook page, GLF Lit Fest, or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM, Bajate Raho. Our session being presented today is Writing About Writing. Andrew Sean Greer in conversation with B. Rowlatt. Andrew Sean Greer's relentless lampooning of the literary world, Less, is about a novelist who tells us about the crazy quilt of a writer's life, warm enough, though it never quite covers the toes. In conversation with B. Rowlatt, he speaks of the highs and lows of the writing life of the doubts and the epiphanies and the constant struggle for experience and self-expression. And what it means to be writing about writing, and in this case, what it means to be talking to you all at 6.30 a.m. in <laughs> uh, American Western time. And Rishon Greer is the best-selling author of six works of fiction, including the novel Less, for which he won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for, for Fiction. He lives in San Francisco. B. Rowlatt is a writer and journalist. Her award-winning travelogue, In Search of Mary, was a biography of the year. She co-wrote the bestseller, Talking About Jane Austen in Baghdad, which was dramatized by the BBC, and is one of Virago's Fifty Shades of Feminism. Her play about Mary Wollstonecraft recently debuted in London's West End. She's also one of our staunchest supporters at the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, just hang in there. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, writing about writing. Andrew Sean Greer in conversation with B. Rowlatt. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sanjoy, and welcome back, everybody. Welcome to Jaipur Literature Festival in its online incarnation, which is called Brave New World. And not going to lie, it's been a, a horrible few months, and I've been starting to feel like it's a cowardly old world outside. And that's why I'm really happy about today's session. We've got the gorgeous Andrew Sean Greer and this book. And this book actually was the right book for me in this tunnel that we're going through. And I think it might be the right book for you too, because it's beautiful and it's very funny. Um, Andrew, welcome. And please, can you introduce us to the book and to Mr. Less? Sure. <laughs> thanks, thanks for doing this, B. <laughs> I know most of us don't have a lot else to do and also have a million other things to do. So it's nice to, take a little time to talk about books. Uh, Les uh, stars Arthur Les, who is a middle-aged, uh, uh, mediocre, somewhat failed novelist who receives an invitation to his, um, his ex-boyfriend's wedding. And rather than say yes or no, he instead looks in his inbox and sees, finds all the invitations that writers get sort of half-baked ideas that I'm sure you get and you think, should I do that? And he says yes to them all. Um, and it takes him on a trip around the world. It's it's a book, well, this session's been described as, as writing about writing, but it's a book that's very much about writers. And I noticed that, you know, some of your most ravishing reviews come from other writers. And I'm really intrigued as to why that is. Have you shone a very, a very intense light into something that writers experience? I mean, I never think of it that way because, in fact, in the book, he does very little writing. There's only true, an India. He does a lot of I, the other stuff that you have to do. I think that's it because I think most people who are not writers don't realize that there's all this other, other stuff. Like even in these days, these very still strange days, we have email lists of people wanting us to could you read part of your book for our YouTube channel for, you know, there's all kinds of little things and you want to say yes. And I really am saying yes to everything these days. How can you say no? But um, in ordinary life, you have to 
put together enough humility and sense of self to know what's worth doing and what is nonsense. Uh, and most of us are so insecure that we um, we will say yes to. <laughs> Talking so on that theme of insecurity, in your cast of characters, we have, of course, Arthur Less, but there are there are a couple of other writers. There's um, there's his his former lover, um, the the very highly esteemed Robert Brownburn. But a particular favourite of mine is is Finley Dwyer, who's kind of his nemesis in a way. He's a, and I put it to you that every writer alive has a Finley Dwyer in their yeah. life. It's someone who whose success kind of kills you a little bit inside. Can you tell us about, about their relationship? Um, Finley Dwyer is a much more ostensibly successful writer um, uh, who, who is maybe much more, I think, intellectual and beloved by the, the literati and who confronts Arthur Lass at a party in, in Paris, of all places, mm -hmm. um, and sort of tries supposedly kindly tells him exactly what's wrong with his writing and why he's not a success, which is not <laughs> This kindly. is my favorite scene. Can I ask <laughs> you to read this scene? I know that everybody goes straight here. I love this scene so much. Would you Would you read a little extract from this? Oh, wait, let me find my book. One second. <laughs> oh, I should, I should let everybody know that, that Andrew's got up at 6.30 in the morning for this. He's remarkably fresh and bright. I hope you've got some coffee in that mug of yours. I do. I'm very do. shiny. Look how shiny you're, very, you're just radiant. I'm radiant. The moisturizer is still soaking in. Um, <laughs> all right, let me start, find it. It's less French. It's one of the many deflating encounters that happened to our dear friend Les. Whew. Let me see if I'll start at. Um, did you ever wonder why you haven't won awards? Finley asks. Time and chance? Why the gay press doesn't review your books? They don't, they don't, Arthur. Don't pretend you haven't noticed. You're not in the canon. Les is about to say he feels very much in the canon, picturing the human cannonballs wave to the audience before he drops out of view, the minor novelist about to turn 50, and then realizes the man who says canon. He's not in the canon. What canon is all he manages to sputter? The gay canon. The canon taught at universities, Arthur. Clear, Finley is clearly exasperated. Wild and Stein and, well, frankly, me. What's it like in the canon? Les is still thinking canon. He decides to head Finley off at the past. Maybe I'm a bad writer. Finley waves this idea away, or perhaps it is the salmon croquettes a waiter is offering. No, you are a very good writer, Arthur. Calypso was a chef d'oeuvre. So beautiful, Arthur. I admired it a lot. Well, now Les is stumped. He probes his weaknesses. Too magniloquent, too spoony, too old, he ventures. We're all over 50, Arthur. It's not that you're, wait, I'm still a bad writer, Finley pauses for effect. It's that you're a bad gay. This attack comes from an undefended flank. It is our duty to show something beautiful from our world, the gay world. But in your books, you make the characters suffer without reward. If I didn't know better, I think you were a Republican. Calypso was beautiful, so full of sorrow, but so incredibly self-hating. A man washes ashore on an island, has a gay affair for years, but then he leaves to go find his wife? You have to do better for us. Inspire us, Arthur. Aim higher. I am so sorry to talk this way, but it had to be said. At last, Les manages to speak a bad gay? Finley fingers a book on the bookcase. I'm not the only one who feels this way. It has been a topic of discussion. But, but, but it's, it's Odysseus, Les says, returning to Penelope. That's just how the story goes. Don't forget where you come from, Arthur. Camden, Delaware. Finley touches <laughs> Les's arm and it feels like an electric shock. You write what you are compelled to as we all do. Am I being gay boycotted? I saw you stand there and I had to take this opportunity to let you know because no one else has been kind enough. He smiles and repeats, kind enough to say something to you as I have now. And Les feels it swelling up within him, the phrase he does not want to say, and yet somehow by the cruel checkmate logic of conversation is compelled to say, 
Thank you. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually a, quite painful. It's quite painful. And, <laughs> and what is captured, there's so, so much happening in this scene, but one of the things I love about it is that it's, 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 like, it's excruciating, it's unbearable how much. He doesn't even know how bad it is, and he says thank you. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's got all of the awkwardness that, um, that he can possibly feel. And it also contains a really interesting debate as well about representation and you know what, what is being required of the work that Arthur as a writer is giving to the world. And I, I'd like you to talk a bit about that, about the, the gay canon and about the responsibility to exist in that space. Well, I think Finley Dwyer is like Arthur Less, he's also me, you know, this is, no one came up to me and said this, this is me in my head talking to myself about what duties do writers have to represent their communities, to challenge their communities, to tell a story that goes outside of what's expected. And I think this is true of almost every writer, um, especially writers who come from minority groups, you feel you want to, for instance, tell the story of your family, but then your family is not gonna like it when they read it because you haven't polished it up and you haven't made heroes and villains. And um, that's always been a struggle for me. It's been is, a struggle. Is, in this analogy, is your family the gay community that you feel that you have to put a positive spin on? Yeah, I do. And I've always, it's why I've never written a book with a gay protagonist because I keep feeling every time I try to do it, I fall into cliches. Um, I, 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 which is why I finally wrote a book that was making fun of someone like me. It was the only way I could kind of get in, which is so, I, this debate is also making fun of me um, and whether I've done enough, done the right things. Um, Have you done enough? I'm doing my best. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's all I can do. say. <laughs> I don't know if I've done enough. I. I can say now that th through no fault, th no fault of mine, I'm more visible and for gay people, for queer people, that's really like half the battle um, is visibility. So luckily. No, absolutely. Does it matter? Does it matter that this is a gay book? Is it a gay book? Eh. <laughs> I mean, sure. I mean, I well, I, I what has surprised me, you know, especially when I was in Jaipur, I had such a long line of young women who were fans of this book, which really interested me. And they all made it clear that they read it as, as a romance and as a kind of, uh, I think a kind of um, gender liberation in a way. They found it empowering and I had not expected that. I would like to think I'm a feminist and that it shows in my work, but it's not that there are so many strong female characters in the book. But, oh, absolutely. Uh, but I, I was really heartened by that, that it would be a book that people might read and feel a sense of joy in, um, in, in being themselves or lost causes or that kind of thing. That feels like the book I really wanted to write. I f yeah, and I feel you really hit upon something there because the, the sensation of joy is, is one that it, it, it happens, it's woven throughout the experience of reading this book. And there's a couple of scenes actually that I find to be very infused with joy. And we'll come back to this because they're, they're, they're themes that I want to explore later. But I also thought on this point that they're, they're scenes that people could get very different kinds of joy from. So I suppose in that, in that positioning of who your reader is and who you're talking to, it's, it's an extraordinary work in that people will get different different threads of joy of their own. Apart from, I have mentioned, of course, your, your many, many dozens of ravishing reviews, but I went on Amazon and found someone that wrote, forgive me for this. They're obviously a oh, tiny no. minority, but somebody wrote, one star, did not know the main character was gay, capital G. <laughs> Wish I could get my money back. <laughs> That's the whole review. I thought, oh, bless them. Should we have a whip round? <laughs> Poor individual. They're called a sergeant, whoever that is. Um, How did they miss did that not part? Know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder when that the penny dropped. I just... It, and it was quite oh, funny. I, 
that would be great to be with that reader when they Isn't throw it across the room. I know, like, but yeah, exactly. The, the, the fight, like, wait a minute, I've been <laughs> robbed. I have to say that made me chuckle. Um, but, you know, to, to return to the theme of representation, um, LGBTQ representation, other issues, um, it, it, it taps into a very real and live debate around identity politics and who we identify in our public persona. Um, and you, 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 you come at this from various angles. I'm particularly keen on. I'm very much in love with the character of Zora, who uh, takes the wind out of poor old Les's sails with her remarks about his white Caucasian ego. In fact, I think the word is, um, oh, so it's a middle-aged white guy wandering around with his middle-aged white guy problems. And Les sort of goes, yes. Um, clearly, you're, you're having that conversation with yourself and thinking, what can yeah. I do with this? Yeah, I mean... Zora's section is the first part of the book I, I wrote, in fact. Um, yeah, because, she's very salty, isn't she? She's very, gets gets into the uncomfortable part places. Of it, yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought what you did, actually, in terms, and this is an interesting technique, and I'd like to know why you chose to do it this way, but you, um, there are certain scenes where you have shown us what you're doing, like a magician going, oh, it's, it's the card, I can see, you know, you, you've shown us your trick. And there's one of the scenes with Zora, and then Les has this conversation and, and you're sort of in that conversation and you talk about how you're gonna make it into a comedy. How, how can I address this? How can I address this subject? I have to do it by making it funny. Well, I mean, it is, uh, this is, I wouldn't say it's a burden. It is a, it is a challenge that I think a lot of white men like myself have recently come to understand, especially in America now, a lot of people have a lot more understanding of because of the Black Lives Matter movement that we have a responsibility to represent other groups um, uh, with uh, thoughtfully, carefully, um, and represent ourselves thoughtfully, carefully. Uh, and it is, but that's true of, that's just being a good writer. You're supposed to be thoughtful and careful the whole time. So um, if I'm writing a book in which there's like a, a middle-aged white guy who has been in so many novels before, traveling around the world, which we've seen a lot of times, and it's caused a lot of very ugly things to happen in books, um, I have to be thoughtful about what I'm doing and not make it a like I'm learning from the exotic world out there, how to be myself, that's not what I wanted at all. I wanted to lampoon that idea. And so I just had to constantly think like, why would anyone read a book about a dude like this? And I know from reading Amazon reviews, a lot of people picked up the book and they were like, I don't wanna read about like a white guy who can afford flights. Like there's enough of those books, thousands, you know? And I wanted in some way to make it, uh, hopefully uh, a surprise and to sort of take the air out of those narratives. But for the for the sort of excruciating scenes that you put him through and for the awkwardness, the delicious awkwardness time and again and the many deflations, there's, it, there is a tenderness, there's, there's certainly an affection. I, I'm very fond of him and I, I feel that you are too. But, yeah, <laughs> He's, he has an innocence that I don't quite have that things go terribly wrong for him, he's humiliated, and yet the very next scene, he's like, I'm sure it'll go great this time, and he stupidity, but at a certain point, it becomes bravery, when you, you will not be, uh, you refuse to learn from the world, you just keep going forward with hope, <laughs> I guess that's courage. <laughs> of, a sort, of a sort, definitely, but combined with a, with a curious sort of vulnerability. Um, I have to say, I found his character really interesting. And I, I wondered about, you know, I'm not sure how, how far you can take this thought, but I, I wondered who would be his literary opposite in the world of literature. And I came up with Heathcliff, you know, as the kind of ultimate toxic male and, you know, who also we secretly fancy. That's not just me, is it? Everyone fancies Heathcliff, don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you for that loud. I mean, we're not supposed to, but, um, and you know, the, it's his vulnerability, and but it brings into question, you know, the issue of likability. And like you said, some of your readers kind of didn't want to go on that journey. How far can you push the likability of your protagonist? 
you want people to to board that flight with less how you know how, how much did you play play with you know how bad how unpleasant you can make him how far can he be repellent well i did one of the tricks is to have him not be the the narrator of the story um Usually we make a first person and I storytelling to make the reader um, fall for the character because you always fall for whoever's telling the story. And so I chose to put it, have a, a narrator tell his story um, so that he would, which is easier for making fun of him. It is, because you almost go, oh, look at him. You actually kind of, you egg us on a bit. And and I'm not going to spoil the ending, but you know, we, we don't know who you are as the narrator. And you're kind of, you know, you're giving us a little nudge and going, oh, look, he's making a bit of an idiot of himself. He's, what a fool. And, and we're, we're urged on by you. There's a, there's a sort of collaborative thing happening there. Um, that was quite an interesting, for us not to know who that voice is right to the end, that was quite an interesting thing. Why did you do that? I... Well, part of it was it was the a, a fun way for me to to get into the book. I mean, you know that part of a large part of writing a piece is finding the right way to tell it. Who's telling it? Where they're telling it from? You know, is it in sections? Is it is in long monologues. All of those choices. Um, once you finally find the right one, it's it's a it's much easier. <laughs> and I found it took me a while to find this one and I would, and it allowed me to have both like an omniscient narrator who could see absolutely everyone's thoughts. And then also a, a first person narrator who knows things no one else would know. Um, it just made it funnier, honestly. Like I. And it adds a bit of mystery. Cause we don't yeah, know who it is. There's yeah. a little thing off at the end, you know? Yeah. I was annoyed that I hadn't seen that coming. Anyway, oh. um, <laughs> I didn't. I was just, you know, I was, I was in a, I was in a world of less, you know. I, could, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see beyond. Um, I just, uh, well, I've lost my question now. Oh, we were talking about Heathcliff. Where the hell did that come from? I was on likability. Yeah. Um, the, oh no, actually, sorry. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump forward off what you've just said about how you approach this. I want to ask you to talk about your practice, how you actually start a book, and how even worse, how you finish a book. Talk us through that, how you do that. Well, I don't know if it's, it's probably not the same for you because it's, sadly, it's different for everybody. Um, I start off with some visual, some image of something I want to happen. And then I start to kind of take notes on a long train ride of other things that might go along with it. That sounds very abstract. And then, then I find a situation I want to put them in. And for this book, it started off as a much more serious book. I wanted it began to- with the character. It began with the character and it was from, it, in a way I stole it from the novelist Colette and she has a novel, Cherie, which is uh, sort of a, a relationship between a 53 year old courtesan and a, and a 20 year old young man. Um, for some reason, I decided to copy that, and I abandoned that after a while. It's it's not that anymore. But I there was something about the 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 sadness of that relationship and the beauty of that, and on from there. And I had an image of someone at the top of the stairs at the end, and I had um, like a few points throughout because I'm a travel writer or I was a travel writer, I decided to take from those stories. That's what I had. Um, and it, I wrote somewhat at random and not in order. Um, I wrote like, a, and I do this now more and more. I fill it out like a crossword puzzle. I answer the things I know and slowly it connects together rather than beginning to end. Oh, that's a quite interesting gestation then, kind of moving not in a straight line. I used to write in a straight line and then I would have a nervous breakdown when the novel was going way off track. And now I don't try to force it anymore. And I write, you know, I wrote um, the last, I think India was the last chapter I wrote. I was in India. That's, I, I, I wanted to write while I was in the country so that I would not invent some fantasy. Um, I had written, the last chapter of Japan up until the last 10 pages. And then I wrote India 
And then I wrote the last 10 pages. You know, I, I saved it for myself, but it seems like a strange way to do it. Um, and, and how do you respond to deadlines? Is that, a, is that instrumental? I'm really good at a deadline. I need it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I, I would float free. How about you? Are you good with a deadline? They're, they're a very galvanizing force, aren't they? They, well, you uh, don't the electricity let us deadline. Down. Yeah. 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 Um, who was it that said, I love deadlines, I love the whooshing sound they make as they as they swoosh past? <laughs> I know. Um, of where, I can't remember where I got that from. Someone online will undoubtedly send that in to us. Um, I want to talk about happiness, because that's what I felt when I was reading your book. And it's a theme that you've addressed in, in earlier books as well. I've got one right here. I've got uh, The Story of a Marriage. Ah. Uh, I was very much enamoured of Pearlie and I thought that her remarks and her observations around happiness very much uh, are explored in less. There's just a little bit I, I, I wanted to, to read out here. Um, she's in, uh, in, in, in the, this woman is, is talking to someone who says, she says to him, before you came, I thought that I was happy. He stopped on the boardwalk and looked at me. That's not the same, he said as being happy but he's wrong if she thinks she's happy she she kind of is happy and this transpires right at the very end when her son says happy enough and I think there's a I think you know turning back to back to Les I think there's a very sort of beautiful celebration of of happy enough and what our expectations are in a sort of crazed consumer society of, of, of what matters. Um, one scene that made me sort of jump up for joy because of this sort of managed version of joy in the expectations is the sunset scene. You know the one I mean? No. Wait, you, do, it, you do, you do. There are uh, camels. In Morocco. Camel. Yeah, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. Enjoy the fucking sunset on your fucking camels. So she's just saying, look, get a grip, man. There's this whole beautiful list. We've made it. We're alive. And actually under lockdown and with corona and the world's just falling to bits, there's this beautiful kind of rant where she says, hang on, I need my specs for this. But she, she, she <laughs> says, oh, you know, it's a miracle we're here. Oh, they're here, not because they've survived the booze, the hashish, the migraines, not that at all. They've survived everything in life. Humiliations, disappointments, heartaches, missed opportunities, bad dads, bad jobs, bad sex and bad drugs, all the tricks and mistakes and face plants of life to have made it to 50 and to have made it to here, to this frosted cake landscape, those mountains of gold, a little table they can see on the dune set with olives and pitta, glasses, a wine chilling on the ice. So yes, as with almost every sunset, but with this one in particular, shut the fuck up. Sorry for the language, people. But there's, a, there's a really kind of like, I'm holding on to this small piece of joy. You might not think it's joyful. And, and I, I love the defense of, of small shreds of joy. And there, there are numerous of them, but I've, I found that very special. Talk about happiness, please, Andrew. Oh, I think you said it all. in the morning. I mean, I think in lockdown, we can all, I found myself saying to my mother the other day, because she just had a wonderful day, and she was beginning to worry about a month from now. And I was like, mom, 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 we don't know a month from now at all. Like, it's, but it's, what's funny is it's always been true, but it's just so visible to us now that like, a month from now, I don't know. But right now, what's precious is actually more precious somehow. Yeah, to me too, to um, a, a, a beautiful day or, um, I don't know, I end up saying like hello to strangers on the street and they say hello back and it's really lovely because we're all sort of lonely and we all went about our days before as if we didn't need those other people and now it becomes, if I see a friend on my stoop in a mask, it's so Bye. beautiful. Yeah. Yes. I, I, miracle. It, I mean, these are awful times, but it makes us, and I'm not very good at being, um, at noticing happiness and joy in beautiful moments. I'm not always good, you know, I, I'm a, I can be grouchy, but these days, much better, because I don't know what's, what's coming, so. 
I have to say, you, you did a, a beautiful, as a recent article you wrote, uh, walking around your neighborhood and encountering and the faces that oh, you see in the places. Yeah, yeah. and, and you, you, you said the line, what use is a novelist in a crisis? All we do is take notes. And I wish to challenge you a bit on that because the taking of notes is a really big deal. Can you expand a little bit on well, the role of a novelist in a crisis? But don't be modest this time. Well, I'll be modest. Um, I think, well, it's been a struggle, I think, for a lot of writer friends of mine to think like, wait, am I supposed to be writing about right now? Or, or what is my, you know, my science fiction novel? What am I, how am I supposed to return to that every day when it feels when I'm so, I want to go out and march for Black Lives Matter, or I want to go distribute sanitizer to homeless people, or, um, and of course you can do those things. And some people need to write about those things for now. That's part, some one part of the job, but um, I'm not good at that part necessarily. I have to write about something for later. And I think it's very, it becomes more clear when we realize so many people who maybe weren't great readers before have become really good readers recently because you get fed up of watching videos, Zoom and then Netflix or something, you know, you a lot of people have turned again to books as something it's more it feels you feel more connected through a book you feel it it there's something that 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 connects your mind makes half the book and it feels more satisfying and communal it's oddly because it's alone and so i realize okay we needed books during this crisis so we have to write books for the next one um, knowing what we know now. Okay, um, we have audience questions coming in. So I just want to say to everybody watching, however you're watching and wherever you're watching, please send in questions for Andrew. Um, the you. team are channeling those to me right now, I believe. Okay, well, anyway, the, the, the question question is out there. Please do write in. I, ha I, I looked around and I know that you're absolutely huge amongst book clubs because lots of my book club friends have read you. Um, oh, yeah. oh, God, yes, all over the place. Oh, I thought yeah. um, in, in my Google meanderings around you, and I promise no more Amazon, but no less a, an authority than the New York Times had a rather marvellous um, questions to ask in your book club about less. So I looked at them and obviously they were really clever, you know, they were better than my questions. And I thought, oh, well, I'll pinch one. Uh, there's a quite funny one here. Wait one second. This is courtesy of the New York Times. Oh, where's it gone? It says something to the effect of um, everybody, wherever less travels, people get sick. Why do you think this is? <laughs> I thought it was a bit harsh, to be honest, but can you ask, answer that one for our book club friends? I, I guess that does happen. I mean, it happens in Germany for sure. And he's certain that he's boring them to death. Um, I think that often happens when, or at least for me, if I do an event and then people start murmuring in the crowd and I think, oh, I'm, I'm boring them. When in fact, like there's something happening behind me. It's not me. You know, it's that's narcissism to think it's you. But in Morocco, a lot of people, they lose them along the way. Um, and I like I say, to think it was very that, good comedy value. Well, it's mostly for comedy. I know people getting sick is it very funny, but it was in Morocco they lose them to too much booze or to it a is, migraine. And he said it, the idea was to leave him alone on his birthday. I mean, I was trying to abandon him, although he's not really alone. Yeah. Um, and what does the New York Times know anyway? Uh, we've got yeah. some we've got some questions coming in now. We've got one from Tamima Anam who says, I just love this book so much. She was rooting for less like me, despite his awkward bumbling. It's funny, satirical, so deeply romantic. How did you do that? How did you make it so romantic? That's hard to answer, to be honest. Um I I wanted to write a book that was romantic. And I think part of what all the tearing him down and ridiculing and, and humiliating him has to be done in order to reward him. You know, I don't think I could have made a Heathcliff, even a gay Heathcliff the whole time and reward him. You would have thought like, well, I think he was doing fine without the, the romance. Could we give it to someone who needs it? And, to make you feel like he really needs it, deserves it. Um, 
and deeply satisfying for the reader as well. Good. I was so, satisfied to write too. <laughs> <laughs> Another question is from Agastya who asks, Less is the first comic novel to win the Pulitzer, Pulitzer in, inside joke. Uh, do you think comic books have become unfashionable lately? I bet they're more fashionable in a time of COVID, you know. I bet. I, I can't just wait for batch of... I got a stack of PG Woodhouse yesterday and I'm like, oh, great. Oh, really? Is that, is that your lockdown feast? Some Woodhouse? <laughs> I, I mean, not always, but just like Agatha Christie, you know exactly what you're going to get, you know, even if it's not that filling. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Very much so. A little of that, you know, and then a little more depth. Uh, but, but also I think that comic novels have like a long esteemed history um, that Don Quixote is a comic novel. And, you know, I think books like Gravity's Rainbow is a comic novel or Infinite Jest, um, the Tristram Shandy comic novel. These are all, you know, great. Now they're long books, often really, really long books. Do you, you know, know, I was, was trying to think of other funny books and I could not for the life of me. Now that you list them all, it seems obvious, but I think something about Corona has made me forget most funny things. Not, so I mean, I think you may be right. Would, would you a groundswell of... of yeah, please, please, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's homework there. After Gay Heathcliff, more comedy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we already uh, have a Gay Heathcliff. I can't Heathcliff. wait. Okay, so another question from Sajdev, uh, Sajdev Ramakrishna, who asks, what's your favourite writing advice? And continues, there's a variety on this from Mural Sparks, Get a Cat, or Scott Fitzgerald, Don't Write and Drink, or Hilary Mantel's A Little Arrogance Can Be a Great Help. Do you have a personal favourite? Ooh, mine is um, Stop While the Iron is Hot, which How is... How do you know? Well, I just mean, like, while you're on a roll in a paragraph and you're like, oh, I think I could... You, you stop halfway through the paragraph and you're like, I'll finish that tomorrow. That is controversial. Because then when you finish it tomorrow, you're like, all right, and you're already in the groove and you can finish writing. Whereas if you hit the end of a chapter, blank page, the next day you're like, chapter two. So you're ending on an upwards trajectory. Yeah, that movement. You pick up with, oh. So that you, you move. I just did it yesterday. Also, it's, it's cheating a little because you can be like, you know what, that's enough. For the day, I, I think but that's I very do it courageous. The... I'd be afraid to miss the rest of the momentum. That's a very courageous advice. Well, sometimes I don't take it because you. I feel the same way that I have something magical is happening and I don't want to stop it. Wow. Well, I hope everybody yeah. will experiment with this. Um, you don't have to take that advice. Yeah. Yes. All my money back. <laughs> we'll have our friend from Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kajoli, so I need my glasses because this print's a wee bit small. Kajoli asks, is your first draft very different from the final product? My first draft, I historically, I will show it to my agent and she will say, um, I have no idea what you're doing, Andrew. <laughs> like, a, apparently my first drafts don't make, like, literally don't make sense. They can't tell even what kind of book I'm writing. So, yes, they're terrible. They're terrible. And Aww. so I'm, and I, they're so bad that I don't, an editor, I can't even trust an editor to work with because they don't know if I'm writing a fantasy or a comic. Like they just can't tell. I don't know what it is wrong with them, but it's okay. Then I go back and I spend a long time fixing them because when I hear those doubts, I'm like, apparently I haven't done a very good job. So, <laughs> it's the revision that makes the book. The revision I love that. Actually, in book. in less, you do you do give a you, you you do a little shout out a herogram to editors and the power that they wield, the power for good. Yeah, um, there's one particular editor of mine who I ridicule specifically in this book, who's a great <laughs> friend of mine, um, oh. who would who would who would often say, you know, I love this paragraph so much, I'm keeping it all for myself. No one else shall ever read it, as a way to persuade me to to cut something. <laughs> that is quite brilliant. I suppose there's a huge art of diplomacy attached to it. And we have another question for you. Elaine Canning asks, has your writing practice changed during these times, during lockdown? Have you been more or less creative? 
less creative because I am used to being very self-centered with, for instance, my family and friends. I will say, no one contact me for the next few weeks. I'm only writing my novel. And my priorities have gone upside down. Now I have to call my mother every day, see how she's doing. I have to talk to my friends every day. Like those things became a priority. And my novel is the thing that has to wait. But I found time to get back to it now. Um, I have more of a rhythm and I'm able to push other things aside and feel comfortable that I still see my mom every day on, on FaceTime, but mm -hmm. I get my novel done, but it's been, it's, and the news is distracting. Oh, I know. I know. But there is also some comfort to be derived from, from the idea that, that everybody's struggling creatively because this is the theme that, you know, I'm, I hear it again and again. Um, and there's just a really nice question. I'm going to ask you to answer it in just about a minute, um, a minute short. Nina asks, do you think that post-pandemic literature would be more empathetic? Oh, God, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it? Ooh. Oh, I'm going to say yes. I love that. That was, that was short and to the point. I mean, you kind of think, if not now, when? I mean, it doesn't even have to be literature. Maybe everything could be more empathetic. It should be. Once we realize that everyone is carrying a burden, because you know that for sure now, if you, we can just keep that idea, that's all we need, you know. It's so true. It's so true. On that very beautiful note, I think I think we have to wrap up now. And I've I've selected my very own end quote from your book. And it is thus. Just for the record, happiness is not bullshit. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> thank you so much, Andrew Sean Grip. It's been an absolute pleasure. Everybody buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. And uh, see you all at Jaipur in some shape or form another time. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. I, I, I love that happiness is not bullshit. And, uh, you know, and, <laughs> and your thought that maybe post-pandemic, whenever that is, PCE, uh, we will all be nicer people or more empathetic people. Not quite seeing that effect right now across the world, but hey, um, no. maybe it's too early to still, and you know we need to wait some time for people to find their empathy deep inside. But I hope they do. Thank you both. That was absolutely delicious. And for all of you, go out and buy lie. It's Big hug. <laughs> fabulous. It's a love story. Yeah. They've said and warm and huggy. And what was that? It doesn't quite cover your toe. <laughs> I know, my toes feel covered <laughs> well thank you both and thank you all for watching and I'm sorry as usual we weren't able to post all your questions we've as usual run out of time uh, thank our radio partners Red FM uh, Red FM Bajate Roho and I hope all of you will log back for our next session at 8.30pm IST the battles within addressing mental health Shelja Sen and Anna Chandy in conversation Anxiety and stress are the order of the day. Transactional analyst and counselor Anna Chandy and Shelja Sen, narrative therapist, author and co-founder of Children First, speak of strategies of coping at a time when the pressures of the lockdown affect children and parents as also the lonely and the isolated. This is at 8.30 p.m. IST. Do log back at that point. Thank you.